year 1944. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. To get another view of the build-up to this operation, we set off on the UK leg of our journey. The small island of Britain became the base from which the Allied invasion force was assembled, trained and launched. Whilst all of the problems about the operation were being worked through in detail, the build-up of men and machines in Britain began at an ever-increasing pace. Operation Bolero swung into action. This was nicknamed the Friendly Invasion. Americans from a different culture, a faraway land with some very different customs. It's really interesting is just how well loved the Americans were in the UK. I mean, obviously there were incidents of fighting, fisticuffs and moments of resentment because the Americans were perceived to be better paid and better fed than um, UK and Commonwealth servicemen. The relationship between locals and Americans who were camped in their vicinity is one that sort of lasted the generation. It really was a marriage made in heaven. Some of the first to arrive in 1942 were the engineering companies to help build the vast numbers of camps and airfields necessary to launch the bombers as they began to pound the German industrial war machine. We went to the most easterly point of the UK, in Suffolk, East Anglia, to see what remained of these airfields that were to play an important part in the build-up to D-Day and during the operation. There it was, the now restored control tower belonging to the 390th Bomb Group, part of the mighty 8th Air Force. The size of these airfields is very impressive. They cover a huge acreage, massive chunks of the English countryside put under concrete and asphalt for the bombers of the US Air Force. Now they're going back to crops, land and pasture, swords into plowshares I guess you could call it. But these big skies with the variable English weather would have been where people would send off those lads of 19, 20, 21, cross over to Germany to bomb the hell out of the Reich and then hopefully come back not just about getting air superiority over the beaches, but over a much larger swathe. The small market towns and tiny villages around here suddenly had this influx of visitors, young, vibrant Americans, some who've never been outside their own country, who suddenly found themselves in a foreign land. Lots of different people and different customs, sometimes almost like a foreign language. Definitely a different type of beer. Once again, the build-up in organisation and force went up a gear and men and machines poured in ever more numbers into the UK. Initial supplies and weapons of war were shipped across Britain by rail and road to camps. Then the troops followed. Next stop at the moment is going to be the D-Day Centre at Castletown, Weymouth, which is an amazing place put together by a hell of a team. They built this from virtually nothing and it's on the site of the embarkation points of many of the US troops, including the 29th and the Big Red One, the 1st Division. I caught up with Steve Ellis George at the D-Day Centre, Castletown, near Weymouth on the south coast of England. And he talked about the impact that the American soldiers had on the local community. It just happens, I move to a village and there's all this big story. Well, it's a memorial in a way. Yeah. And we're getting people from all over coming down, especially to see it. It's just because it's this American story and it's different to everyone else. So the way they, they were sort of thought of here is sort of very laid back, generous, generous with their money, generous with food, um, supporting the local communities, parties for children, that sort of stuff. You know, it's rationing, times are hard, you know, very austere, I guess. Everything's very orderly and the Americans come in, these cowboys or whatever. Obviously they're training, they're working and doing all that sort of stuff, but they're here for a long time and this is probably, for a lot of them, it's the last place they ever had any fun. So, you know, they're letting off steam. You know, these are young guys, they're the peak of their fitness, 
So they were having a whale of a time and a bit like a whirlwind. That's how, that's a good way to describe it. They came in here and it's jazz music and it's all this craziness and partying. They were enjoying themselves when they here, there's no doubt about it. One thing that the Americans brought and left with the British was music. Dance music, swing, jazz and boogie woogie. This was always guaranteed to liven up an evening in the local pub and the pounding beat of this new music opened the eyes and ears of the Brits for generations to come. They really didn't like being here, complaining about the beer, complaining about the chips, complaining about the weather. You can't blame them for that because, you know, they're a long way away from home. They just wanted to get on, fight, get the war done and get home. You know, all these hundreds of camps just in the county and the marshalling and the equipment, the men, the machines and the infrastructure. It's like someone said, we're going to do this and they did it. Basically everything that's heading to Omaha Beach for the 6th of June is based in Dorset. They're, they're not just passing through, they've been here since more or less the summer of 43. So they're in the county, they're embedded here for a, a very long time. Um, the impact locally is huge, you know, not, not only integrating with the local communities, but the changes to infrastructure and road building, uh, the changes to the ports, that sort of thing, just to make sure that this war machine is gonna move smoothly when the time comes. Many of these early troops were black soldiers, classified at this time in the war as not suitable for frontline combat and part of a racial segregation system that was not present in Britain. When Uncle Sam called after Pearl Harbor, a lot of us were drafted into the army. Many of us volunteered, but we were not given an active frontline troop status. We were class to support troops. When we got shipped out to England, we didn't know what to expect. Most of us guys had never been out of Detroit, never mind out of the country. Those Brits had some weird customs. Food, drink, their love of pubs. <laughs> but we also found out about what they'd been through. But, um, they were here before the whites came, so obviously they're building everything, the engineers. Um, again, adopted by the locals, drank with the locals, everyone loved them. Then the whites came, tried to kick them out of some of the pubs, but the locals actually said, no, you can sling your hook, these guys are with us. Um, up on the island, there's a street called Reform. Um, Gunfight one night, it was a proper OK Corral moment with Blacks down one end and the whites down the other end, and it was a, a doorway to doorway shooting from the hip gun battle on, on the island of Portland. You know, um, the separation of camps, you know. The initial acceptance was a real relief for us. And sure, we chased girls. But what the hell? What soldier away from home would he chase women? Well, let me tell you, there are a lot of women who chased us too. We hit the road again in search of the wartime base of the 82nd Airborne, further north into the Midlands. Elements of the battle-hardened and well-trained 82nd Airborne Division were billeted at Corn, in the centre of the country. The population of this small market town almost doubled as the village played host to 2,000 American paratroopers. The proximity of the railway meant it was an ideal location as the troops could arrive quickly by train and leave easily when required. The 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the US 82nd Airborne Division arrived in Quorn on February the 14th, 1944, Valentine's Day, and pitched their olive green bell tents in the grounds of Quorn House. You couldn't get much more English than this. Bluebells, cattle, Woodland. Sue Templeman heads up the Quorn Historical Society and with her colleagues has traced much of the history and the individual stories of townsfolk and paratroopers. We met up in one of the 82nd's favourite pubs, the White Horse. and they'd gone straight into North Africa and Sicily, so all that time they were in a war zone. Basically, they called it their second home because it was so relaxed. 
How do you think they would take this small, little, compact, close-knit English village? And they had a book. Oh, they had a book. They had a book. Yeah. So they were warned yeah. about our warm beer and things yeah. like that, and yeah. the different mm. words for things. You yeah. Know, yeah. So warned he... about how to behave around us. <laughs> Funnily enough, not to go chasing after women and things, but. <laughs> I don't think it stopped many of them, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest issue was boredom. Periods where the weather wasn't great, for example, and they couldn't do practice parachute drops with the troop carrier groups and couldn't go out on exercise, for example. The divisional commander, Matthew Ridgeway, was, was given his own individual quarters. Conference where they discussed the drop and the success of the pathfinders in marking the drop zones and how well the troop carrier groups performed. In England, they'd had austerity since 39 onwards. When the Americans come, they all carry gun. Great, they're all film stars. They're all fantastic, got loads of money. Fantastic. And a lady told me at one Remembers Day, I said, did they get to annoy you? Said, no, we loved it. Overpaid, oversexed, and over here, they said. But the girls loved them. With their smart uniforms, their dollar bills, and their jitterbug dancing, the Yanks had launched a sort of Operation Romeo and had captured their defenseless hearts. <laughs> They were glamorous, mm. they'd got money, they'd got rations. Mm. For the children, life had been unutterably dull. Mm. They'd not got their fathers because they, they were fighting. Suddenly, these guys came with their sharp uniforms, their accents mm. that you'd only heard in films. I say the money, the sweets. How they went to a, a local fish and chip shop, but they'd got chickens. Where they'd got them from, who knows, but they asked for Chippy to deep fry them for them. And the Chippy said, well, we'll do it for you, but we can't spare the oil. They we went off and they came back with huge blocks of lard to fry the chickens in. You know, and these, the, the people around the Chippy must have just been like, where are you getting this stuff from? But it wasn't all innocent fun and games. There was a deadly serious side too. Some of the local children found that they could scavenge food and other material from the American camp. One of the local youngsters had been out scavenging in the camp and he brought home a mortar bomb. Playing on a makeshift seesaw in the back garden of the house. And banged down on this mortar and the mortar went off and uh, he was taken to the hospital but he died. A reminder of the strength of some of these past relationships is providing a bit of a mystery here in the sleepy town of Cork. Somebody contacted me and said that there'd been some flowers. Every year in June, there is a bunch of flowers laid with a little card dedicated to the memory of Chuck. A birthday memory, Sergeant Chuck Bergdorf, 505 Parachute Regiment, 82nd Airborne, USA, 1920 to 1944, Love Always, Joyce. We have no other information apart from the fact that she seems to be very old. Some things are maybe better left unanswered. Chuck was stationed in Corn, survived the D-Day drop, and was awarded two medals and returned to the village. Until the regiment was dropped into Holland as part of Operation Market Garden. He lost his life at Nijmegen. And he's not forgotten. So 75 years on, and somebody still remembers him. Every birthday, the anniversary of his death. Many British women sail to America as GI brides heading for a glamorous land with their American soldier husbands. Some already had babies who grow up to be American citizens. Yet nearly all these young women knew America only from Hollywood movies. They had married men who talked like Clark Gable and smiled like Van Johnson. But sadly, Many of these runaway brides would find that their romantic voyage into the American dream would end in the shipwreck of divorce. Unbeknown to me, another local consequence of these times was sitting talking to us in the room. 
His father was stationed here with the 82nd. I mean, my father and mother met in Loughborough and were married at St. Peter's Church, I think it was, after he came back from Germany. Because he was a high pointer, he was transferred from the 505 to the 507 to get him back here. And they married um, just around about the declaration of the, uh, the end of the war. He was from Texas and the family's from Texas. We were born in Texas. He was a ranch hand. After the war, everybody thought everything was going to be great. Well, it wasn't, because as a ranch hand, you weren't paid a lot. And anyway, um, then after 10 years of marriage, I think they'd had enough of each other and my mother brought us back. Interestingly, we came back to the area which our grandparents were from. While the paratroopers practiced with their C-47s, the boffins looked at ways of getting tanks and heavy vehicles on shore and across the beach. But putting tanks into big ships closing on a well-fortified shore would make easy targets for the heavy German guns. The answer to getting armour onto the beach quickly was as bizarre as it was successful. A swimming tank. The Tank Museum at Bovington holds one of the few complete remaining DD tanks in the world. 32 tonnes of tank. OK, let's make it float. How are you going to do that then? We're going to put a canvas skirt around it. Yeah, 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 that'll work, won't it? It did. Basically, at the back of a normal Sherman, the engineers put a pair of propellers. But to get more of an idea about how these were developed, I went to see the man who used to manage the estate where these experimental vehicles were tried and tested at the tiny village of Fritton in East Anglia. I am reliably informed that it's somewhere around here small lake of Britain. I reckon stop and ask someone and hope that I understand what they say. I caught up with Stuart Burgess who knows an awful lot about these experimental vehicles and the lakes where they were tested. The word duplex drive means two as in two forms of propulsion yeah. and in this case the tank is a tank that both has tracks that revolve and also a propeller that enables it to swim on water. But if they could get tanks with the first wave, then they stood a better chance on the beach. The inventor was a Czech guy who worked on this assiduously for several years. At first everybody poo-pooed it, saying this'll never work. I could see their reasoning. I mean, Nicholas Strausler, when he first sort of developed it with the Tetra, uh, the military commanders must have been laughing. It was held up by inflated rubber tubes on the inside, like big bicycle tyres. The tanks had to uh, be able to float, and even though you're 30 tonnes, it's the displacement caused by the screen that gives you 35 tonnes of displaced water, meaning they could float. They actually uh, had supporting struts on the inside that locked, and obviously the columns gave the vertical support. 32 tonnes of steel with the driver under the waterline, the commander perched on the top, peering over the edge of the skirt, and steering was by two rudders, which more or less worked. But that tiller was also connected to the driver, and that was just a simple pole moved to the starboard and to the port. Well, they used Valentine for training. The Valentine was the main UK uh, tank that was in production, and they converted 625 Valentines for training. Until just before D-Day, it was going to be a mixed formation of uh, some units with Valentines, some units with uh, Shermans. But the Americans came in and started um, helping with the production and so they did have enough Shermans. At the end of early May was when they got their Shermans and then had to be retrained very quickly on Shermans, two days each. So right. they didn't have a lot of training with the Shermans. I've sat on John's Valentine DD and my first impression was exactly like yours. How can this screen possibly support all this weight? And yet it did. And that's what amazes me. You just think of the, the engineering, the fact that they, they were confident in this. Most American, British and Canadian DD tank crews went through this training at Fritton. Some of them said, I actually joined the army because I didn't like flying, I didn't like heights, and I couldn't swim so I wouldn't join the navy. And yet there they were, becoming submariners. They were paid submariners' wages to do the role. DD also stood in some people's eyes for death by drowning, unfortunately. So they were launched from a landing craft tank, and then they would be launched down a ramp with the screens erect in second gear, and then the driver would then engage the propeller, and then, and then swim the 1,000 to 5,000 metres to the shore. 
1,000 to 5,000. Yeah, they practice at different ranges. That's a long way, isn't it? But remember, of course, the freeboard, that amount of water between the top of the tank was about four foot on the Sherman. So they could tolerate quite high waves. And of course, they pitch and roll with the waves anyway. So you've got an hour and 20 minutes on top or inside a tank with a canvas skirt around it. Yeah. Fairly heavy, choppy weather. They were confident to go down their ramps on the morning of the June 6th. You know. Now, how old were the lads on this, the men? Goodness me, some of them were just out of school, weren't they? They were boys, really. They were um, 18, some possibly 17, I'm not sure. Because Eisenhower came to Fruit and Lake and actually rode on a duplex drive Valentine with Percy Hobart and Churchill was here and he was in favour of it and they were the only funnies that they actually used. Specialist tanks were nicknamed funnies by the troops. These were tanks adapted to deal with specific obstacles on D-Day and beyond. The difficulties had been identified by secret agents, photo reconnaissance, the French resistance and SOE operatives in their clandestine research, and the Allies became adept at producing countermeasures to deal with them, such as the flail tank for clearing mines, the bobbin for laying a mat over soft ground, bridging tanks for crossing ditches and rivers. These and more were developed primarily for the D-Day assault to help get the troops and armour across the beach and engage the enemy quickly. When on June the 6th, the time finally came, their effectiveness was instrumental in ensuring success on D-Day. One other very specialised vehicle produced initially for D-Day was the BARV. Beach Armoured Recovery Vehicle. We met with one of them just before we left for France. And as far as we know, there are only two out of the original 50 built running today. D-Day HR. Once the initial foothold on the enemy coast has been secured, following formations will be sent in to exploit this success. An American Sherman tank, modified by the British to clear stricken vessels and vehicles from the landing beach for the next wave of men and machines. Beaches may be narrow and exits from them few, and therefore it is of the utmost importance to keep these beaches and exits clear. This vital responsibility is the task of the beach recovery section, who land immediately after the assault. This one, two Detroit diesel 671s. Right, two stroke diesel. So if they flood, they will still run. Divers who would attach hawsers and hooks onto stricken vehicles. One unlucky bloke who was a shallow diver and he was outside with all his diving kit, like to rope things on and chain them up and that, you know, while getting shot at. It's always a good job opportunity, that one, isn't it? And going down into 12 feet of water and shackling a tow rope onto a submerged AFV is all in the day's work as far as they're concerned. Push the landing craft back out, drag stuff out off the ships, drag stuff out of the way. Basically keep it, keep it clear so you get more stuff in. Yeah, so that's really what the job was, wasn't it? And a glorified tug. And the driver of a recovery vehicle, wading and towing in deep water, where he can't see a thing, really does have to know his vehicle. We were going over to Normandy from here, but unfortunately we've got other issues which have sort of got in our way, so we can't do it sadly, so... And on the 70th anniversary of D-Day, this was at the beach at Aramanche, and she pulled off some trucks that got stuck in the sand. So she's still working, still doing her job. Another ingenious creation was designed by an American yacht builder. Rod Stevens of Sparkman and Stevens Incorporated took the basic frame and running gear from the ubiquitous GMC Deuce and a Half and turned it into an amphibious truck to ferry men, machines and supplies from large vessels offshore up through the beach and across country to where they were most needed. More of the stuff was carried on these than anything else from the big ships to the shore. Its military classification was D-U-K-W. Everyone else referred to it as the Duck. Increasingly, the sharing of intelligence and technology by the Allies was adding to their chances of making the invasion a success. And there was still more to come. 